The Bible was the most incredible book ever written and ever has been and ever will be. Compiled over 1,500 years by some 40 different authors across three continents, the Bible is complete and consistent in its content. It, is, it has no contradictions in it whatsoever. Men have tried to suggest some, but again, the Bible has been proven time and time again to be complete and consistent throughout. It is infallible, it is, it is inspired, and it is the inerrant Word of God. But it is also indestructible. Throughout the years, many have tried to bin it, to burn it, to ban it, but they can and never will succeed because this is the enduring Word of God. Also, what makes this book stand out from every other book in the world is its prophetic content. This book contains nearly one third of it is Bible prophecy. For example, we look at the book of Daniel. So detailed and amazing and precise are the predictions found within it that came, came to fulfillment with stunning accuracy that many secular scholars have tried to post-date the book of Daniel to after its events. In this book in Isaiah, in chapter 44, verse 28, King Cyrus is named, by name, 100 years before he was ever on the scene, as the man who would give the edict and decree for Jerusalem to be rebuilt and the foundations of the temple to be relayed. But then focusing all of human history on one man, on Jesus Christ, we have prophecy after prophecy after prophecy focused on Christ himself. Of just his birth, his life, his death and his resurrection, more than 300 prophecies about Jesus. And those events are recorded in the Old Testament. How many of those came to fulfillment? Every single one of them with 100% accuracy. When we look at all of this prophecy throughout the Bible, this is something that no other religious text or other faith can lay claim to. In fact, the Bible contains more prophecy than all of those other texts combined, because this is the Word of God. God ordained all the things needed from the beginning. He ordained our salvation, and Christ is coming again, and all of this is contained in the Scriptures here. And if Christ came and everything was fulfilled with 100% accuracy, we can also look to the end of this age when Christ said he is coming again and everything the scriptures say will come to fulfillment. But on this special day, our hearts turn to the sacrifice Christ made on the cross, the culmination of his life's work when he would die for the sins of the world. And those details, again with stunning accuracy, are recorded for us here in Isaiah chapter 53, this wonderful prophetic text around those events surrounding Christ's death and what he has accomplished for us on the cross. All of that centers on verse 6. If you would look down the page with me at Isaiah 53 verse 6, we read, All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. We have a serious problem. God calls that problem sin. Ever since the foundation of the world, we have been struggling with sin. And using the imagery here of sheep without a shepherd, this world has strayed in its sin. It's strayed from the shepherd and has gone and wandered off. And we, like sheep, have gone astray. But the thing is, that sin is not simply that we have just walked away from God. This fundamental problem of sin is the fact that we deserve punishment. We must one day stand before God to give an account for our sins, because nothing we can do can atone for it. We cannot do enough good that can make amends, that can restore a broken relationship with God, because God is holy and we are not. And so God had promised, he made a means by which a sacrifice could be made on our behalf to pay the penalty for our sin so that that relationship with God could be restored. And this is the love, this is the grace, and this is the mercy of God because he sent his son to die for us when we were unworthy. 
when we were like sheep going astray, we were deserving of death. But God sent Jesus, the great shepherd, to go and seek the sheep and bring them home. Because there in verse 6, we learn that Jesus Christ became our substitute. He died on our behalf because the Lord laid on him the iniquity, that is our sin, of all of us. He placed that on Christ. And so Jesus Christ is our substitute. He took the penalty of sin upon himself on our behalf. As we work through Isaiah 53 together, now time, of course, will not permit us to do an exhaustive study on this. But what I'd like to highlight are 10 things, 10 aspects as to how Jesus Christ is our substitute. The first of these, that he is our splendorless substitute. By that, I mean that he is without splendor and without majesty, without form. When he was here on earth, for all intents and purposes, He was a plain, ordinary man. In Philippians 2.6, we learn that though he, that is Jesus, was in the form of God, he did did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Because the scriptures make it abundantly clear that Jesus Christ existed before the foundation of the world. But according to God's plan, he stepped out of the glories of heaven. He took on human form and he was born in the likeness of you and I. He became a man, but beneath that, he was still God. But he lived a perfect, sinless life on earth. But this is interesting, what we learn here is that, and a remarkable fact, is the fact that Jesus was actually quite ordinary, and as we learn from this verse here, he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. If we were to look at a picture of Jesus, we perhaps would have thought he wasn't a particularly handsome man. He would have been very ordinary, but that's the thing, is even like people chose Saul to be their king, they saw somebody that could lead them. Perhaps Jesus was more like David, like an ordinary person, but he had a heart after God because he was God. And Jesus had no form or majesty. That glory was cloaked in his humanity. Nothing special to look at, but he was splendorless. But his purpose was not to woo mankind to please mankind or to make us desire him in any way. His purpose was to go all the way to the cross. This is why he was not only our splendorless substitute, he was also our scorned substitute. In verse 3, we read that he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Jesus did many great things through his earthly ministry. He healed many. He performed great miracles. He fed people. He did all sorts of things that the people absolutely loved. But it's for that that the religious establishment hated him. They wanted to do away with him. They wanted to kill him. And by their scheming and their plans, through that he was despised and rejected. Those are the ones that scorned and shunned and shamed him. And he was sent all the way to the cross. So he was our scorned substitute. But moving on to verse 4, we learn that he was also our supportive substitute. Jesus did the most loving, self-sacrificing thing ever. He said, no greater love has no man than this than to lay down his life for his friends. And that is precisely what Jesus did. He laid down his life for us. But here in this particular verse, in Isaiah 53, 4, we learn in the first half of that verse that surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. This is another way of saying that he carried our sickness, our pain, our suffering, our sin. These are the things that Jesus carried upon himself when he went to the cross, when he hung on the cross. Our sin, our iniquities, our grief, our pain was all placed on Jesus Christ. 
And this is how he supports us. Even today, he is our great high priest because he knows the ways in which we are tempted. He knows our struggles in life. And he is there still continuing to pray for you at the right hand of the Father. But this particular passage, this particular chapter in Isaiah is focused on the events of the cross where Jesus took our grief and he bore and carried our sorrows on the cross. Yet the verse goes on to say that we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. The crucifix, the cross, crucifixion itself was an horrific death. It is the kind of death too that was seen with scorn and with shame. It was reserved for the worst of criminals. Even though we know Jesus was innocent, he suffered the worst death possible. And this is where the religious establishment hated what he had done. And the thing is, through that, he was seen to be despised and smitten by God, as if God had afflicted him, that maybe he'd failed in some way. Whilst we know that that is not the case, but this was the view of the people. Because he was our supportive substitute, but fourthly, also, he is our suffering substitute. There are details here that we learn of what Christ actually suffered on the cross for us. And I'll apologize in advance if this is shocking to you, if this is heart-wrenching, because it is important that we understand all that Christ suffered on the cross for us. The details of what he would suffer were predicted 700 years before he went to the cross. If we look back at Isaiah chapter 50 and verse 6, we learn in that verse, Jesus, essentially speaking on behalf of Jesus, I gave my back to those who strike. Note that he gave his back. No one forcibly took Jesus' back or whipped him, but essentially what happened at that point is Jesus was bound to a post, and they took leather straps, a whip that was dipped in liquid and, and coated in shards of glass and other uh, gritty substances, and they struck his back again and again. With each beating of the whip, they would be tearing the flesh from his back, blood pouring from his back. He would have been in agony, yet silent at the time, taking beating after beating. They scorned him. But not only that, it says, and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. They would have ripped his beard out completely, just off his face. He was beaten. They even placed a crown of thorns on his head. That verse also goes on to say, he didn't hide his face from disgrace and spitting. This is all as part of his trial. And before it even come before Pilate, they beat him to a pulp. He was bloodied. He was bruised. He would have been weak even from loss of blood. Yet he was in charge the whole time. He gave himself up to these things. In chapter 52 of Isaiah, in verse 13, it says, Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up. He shall be exalted. Yes, Jesus is exalted today. He is in heaven. But this is not speaking of his heavenly exaltation. It's speaking of him being high and lifted up on the cross where the people above their heads, they could look up and see Jesus on the cross. But note the following verse. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. You know, as Jesus was being taken away to be crucified, he lacked the strength to even carry the cross on his own back up the hill and they had to enlist the help of some stander by that would carry it for him. But when Jesus was hanging on the cross, so beaten, so bloodied, so bruised, perhaps so swollen, he would have been nearly unrecognizable. Not only the pain in his body, but now having the, the nails driven through his wrists and his feet, hanging there on the cross. Crucifixion was the worst punishment possible because it was a slow, asphyxiating death. And there is Jesus hanging on the cross, taking upon himself our sins, but his blood being shed for us. Because Hebrews tells us that without the shedding of, of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Moving now back into Isaiah 53, verse 5 goes on in more detail, but he was pierced for our transgression. Because at the point that Jesus died too, is one of the soldiers took a spear and pierced him in the side and blood and water poured forth. 
That was proof that Jesus was already dead at that particular point in time. And this actually happened, fulfilling the fact of what was actually written here in Isaiah, but also that Jesus had died. He did not swoon on the cross. He didn't pass out, as some pretend to want it to be, that Jesus didn't actually die. He did die and he did rise again. We'll cover that in a moment. But his side was pierced. But that verse also goes on to say that he was crushed for our iniquities. With all that beating, with all that crushing, not one of his bones was broken. That was fulfillment of yet another prophecy. To hurry up crucifixion, what they would often do is break the legs of the men hanging on the cross, that it would bring on that suffocation, that asphyxiation much quicker. But they didn't have to do that to Jesus because he was already dead. Again, fulfillment of yet another prophecy. But here it was the chastisement that brought us peace was placed upon him. And with his wounds, we are healed. This chastisement being placed on him speaks of Christ being our substitute, our suffering substitute. Because by his wounds, by the stripes on his back, by his beard that was plucked, by the crown of thorns placed on his head, by the nails that went through his wrists and his feet and hanging on the cross, all of that was placed on him so that by those wounds, we could be healed. Speaking here not of physical healing, although that is an aspect where God will obviously heal people at times, but the healing here is a spiritual one. That because of what Christ paid for on the cross, our sins could be forgiven. Our brokenness, our sorrow, our grief, our sin could be done away with so that we could be restored in our relationship with God. And by His wounds, we are healed. Furthermore, Even though he is our suffering substitute, he was also our silent substitute. Reading on in verse 7, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Jesus is the one that laid down his life. No one took it from him. He was actually arrested in the dark of night for fear of the crowds. The religious leaders didn't want the crowds to know because they would have opposed this, but he was arrested at night and there was a sham trial. They brought forth people that were bringing false testimony against him. Whilst Jesus could have opened his mouth and given his own defence, he remained silent Because he didn't make no appeal, he made no defense, but he was to go willingly to the cross because this was the will of the Father. And Jesus at all times was so obedient to the will of his Father, he would go all the way to the cross, knowing what it would be to suffer in our place on the cross. So not only then is he our silent substitute, sixthly, he is also our stricken substitute. By oppression, And judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? The word cut off here essentially means to be killed. He was sacrificed. Whilst he gave up his life, he was killed at the hand of those that would enact this upon him. But who is it that that, are being considered at this time? Those that are stricken, or that, that closing statement for the transgressions of the people, whilst Christ was hanging on the cross, they did not know at that time and in that moment that there Jesus was taking upon himself the transgressions of his people, the sins of his people. They saw him stricken and afflicted, but Jesus was dying on behalf of the world. They could not see at the time. But why could he do this? Not only was he our stricken substitute, but he was also our stainless substitute. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. The grave of the wicked means the type of sacrifice reserved for the worst of criminals. And this was the most excruciating death, but even though he was innocent... In thought and in word and in deed. Jesus had never done anything wrong. It was a sham trial. False charges brought against him and he was sacrificed even though he was innocent. But it was a wicked, it was a cruel, it was an excruciating death. 
But here comes the fulfillment of yet another prophecy with a rich man in his death, his grave. Because we learn from the gospel accounts that Joseph of Arimathea, he was a Pharisee, one that was not standing with the rest of the religious establishment. He would have otherwise opposed Christ's death. But he went upon Christ's death and learning of that, he went to Pilate to request the body of Jesus. And lovingly taking that body and quickly wrapping it in a shroud, he placed him in his very own tomb. A tomb that had never had a a dead person placed in it. It was a brand new, a pure tomb, but of a rich man. And Jesus then, in fulfillment of prophecy, was placed in that tomb. Although we know that he wouldn't stay there. Not only then was he our stainless substitute, in verse 10 we also learn that he was our submissive substitute. There are a few details to unpack here. Firstly, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. This was the divine purpose of God. It was the will of God from the beginning of creation to this point that Jesus would go all the way to the cross. It was God's will. And Jesus submitted himself to the Father's will to go all the way to the cross. To do what? Following on in that verse, when his soul makes an offering for guilt. This speaks of a guilt offering, a sin offering. Something was foreshadowed in the sacrificial system of the Old Testament. Jesus became the final, the complete offering for guilt, for sin as he hung there on the cross. And continuing on in that verse, he shall see his offspring, he shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Because we learn here that death was not the end of the story. Jesus just didn't die and go to the grave. He would rise again after three days. And this is something we will celebrate on Sunday. Because Jesus didn't stay in the grave. Our sins didn't only go to the grave, but he rose victorious, vindicating everything that he'd said and done, his innocence. And for the payment of sin, it was all vindicated. Because not only was he our submissive substitute, therefore he is our satisfactory substitute. You know, as Christ hung on the cross, at high noon, darkness came across the land. This was not a solar eclipse. This was the time of Passover, of a new moon. It was impossible for a solar eclipse, but darkness came over the land. Why? Because it was at that moment, at high noon, the sins of you and I were placed on Christ. Such a dark day, yet such a glorious light that would shine only three days later, but the sins of the world were placed on Christ. Why? Because because of that and the wrath of God that is due to each and every one of us because of our sin was placed on Christ. And the wrath of God for your sin, for my sin, for the sins of the world was poured out on Jesus. Think about that for the moment. Every sin you could commit in your entire lifetime, multiply billions of times over, was placed on Christ's shoulders, bloodied, beaten, bruised, plus the sins of the world laid upon him, and God in that moment poured out his wrath on Jesus. That punishment that is due to you and I for our sin was in its intensity poured out on Christ, and Jesus drunk the cup of God's wrath to its dregs. He took the payment of our sins upon himself on the cross. Because here in Isaiah 53, verse 11, we learn that out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. That that sacrifice Christ made on, on our behalf satisfied the wrath of God. Because when we put our faith in him, because our sins were transferred to Christ, that payment is made in full. As Jesus hung on the cross with one of his last breaths, he said, to die." It means paid in full. He paid in full for your sin upon himself on the cross. You could never, ever pay off that debt, but he did it in a moment. He took that and it was paid in full. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. This is the great exchange. Because Jesus took our sins upon himself on the cross, but his record of righteousness, 
when we put our faith in him, is transferred to us. So that if your faith is in Christ, and one day you have to stand before him to give an account, he is not looking at the record of your sin. That was paid for in full on the cross. What God will do in that moment, from now and through eternity, he looks upon you and he sees Christ. He sees the righteous life of Christ. His perfect record of his life. Because our sins are washed clean. We are made white as snow, white like wool. Because not only was this a satisfactory substitute, we learn from Isaiah 53 that Jesus was our sin-bearing substitute. That last verse, Isaiah 53, 12, Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Here is the imagery of a conqueror sharing his victory. Because Jesus, we know, didn't stay in the grave, that God raised Jesus Christ as victorious. And this language here paints this picture for us, that Jesus would be exalted. He would be seated at the right hand of the majesty of the throne on high in heaven, where he intercedes for us. He prays for us until the time that he comes back to earth to rescue us, of course, but also to bring retribution against sinners that fail to put their faith in that sacrifice on the cross. Payment must be made for sin. When we put our faith in Christ, that is dealt with, that is done by what Christ did. But all those who reject Christ will have to pay for their sin themselves. But this is where Jesus, for us who have put our faith in him, This glorious truth is that he's paid for it. He's made intercession for us and he prays for us and it secures our acceptance before God. That one day, if we were to die today and stand before God in heaven, he is not looking at us, a wretched sinner, he is looking at Christ, his perfect son, and that we've been perfected in him and washed clean. And this is the wonderful truth of Jesus Christ as our substitute. He is our splendorless, scorned, supportive, suffering, silent, stricken, stainless, submissive, satisfactory, and sin-bearing substitute. All of this was prophesied 700 years before Jesus Christ was born. 700 years before he would live that perfect life and go all the way to the cross. And all of this and the 300 plus prophecies of Christ's life were fulfilled 100% with complete accuracy because this was the will of God. It was the plan of God from the beginning. Ever since the fall of mankind, ever since sin came into the world, God promised he would send a saviour. And that saviour was his own son, Jesus Christ, who went all the way to the cross to offer salvation to us. This is the salvation that we remember today, this Good Friday. A day in in Jewish sacrificial systems is the Passover. From what we've learned of even the history of Israel back in the past, that Israel, at the day of Passover, before they came out of Egypt, a lamb was sacrificed, a perfect, sinless, or a, a perfect lamb was sacrificed and blood placed on the doorposts and lintels so that judgment would pass by the children of Israel. That was foreshadowing Jesus Christ, that perfect lamb that was sacrificed for us, his blood that was shed on that cross for us. That same very day, God sent his son and Jesus willingly went all the way to the cross for our sin. He became our substitute and he remains our substitute forevermore. May we put our faith and trust in him and remember all that Christ has accomplished for us on the cross because he is God and he is worthy of our praise. Let's offer a word of prayer to him now. We thank you, our dear Heavenly Father, for Jesus Christ. Knowing what was to befall him, he willingly went all the way to the cross. He left the glories of heaven, took on human form, but he lived a perfect sinless life and went to the cross so that he could pay the penalty for our sin. Heavenly Father, we just ask this day, Lord, as we remember all that Christ has done for us, our hearts will be filled afresh with the wonder, the awe, but also the thanks and the tears, knowing what he had to suffer on our behalf, but the joy knowing that that 
payment has been made in full and that we have joy forevermore waiting for us as we look forward to the day that he comes and returns and brings us home, that we may stand before you in glory, made righteous through the blood of Jesus Christ that was sacrificed for us. And for that, we can offer only endless thanks and praise. As we come soon to the Lord's table, to your table, we ask, Lord, that we would have that deep, rich, renewed appreciation for all that Christ has done for us. We give you thanks this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.